everybody, and welcome to Heart of the Matter. I am your host, Elizabeth Vargas, and I hope you are having a wonderful October so far. Today, I'm really excited to welcome to Heart of the Matter an award-winning author and journalist, David McGee. He is an incredible talent, and he has written an incredible book. I've got to be honest. This book is so honest and so raw, it takes your breath away. David is in recovery for alcohol use disorder. He used alcohol to self-medicate anxiety. But David has a family that has suffered with a lot of substance use disorder. David lost his son, William, at the age of 23 to a drug overdose, a tragedy that continues to ripple for many, many years throughout that family. He also nearly lost his second son to drugs. Hudson was in a coma for three days. And his daughter, he writes in this book, suffers from eating disorders. So he calls them just an average American family. And in some ways, he sadly may not be off the mark. 20 million people, more than 20 million, suffer with substance use disorder. And there are at least 20 million families out there grappling with the same thing. David has not just written this memoir called Dear William, a father's memoir of addiction, recovery, love, and loss. He's also started the William McGee Center for Wellness Education to help college students deal with mental health and with substance use. He has dedicated his life after a terrible tragedy to helping other families avoid the same fate. And without further ado, I give a warm welcome to David McGee. David McGee, welcome to Heart of the Matter. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. I have to say, you wrote this book. It's an extraordinary book, um, saying it's a, quote, a very honest story about an average American family. And yet, in so many ways, your family didn't seem ordinary. I mean, to the outside world, you look like the perfect family. And yet, you know, the struggles that you talk about so openly in this book— You struggled with alcohol um, and an addiction to Adderall. You lost a son to an overdose. Another son OD'd and spent three days in a coma. Your daughter struggled with an eating disorder. How is that average? My gosh. (sighs) You know, when you recite it all back, Elizabeth, I mean, it, it is sometimes hard for me even to get my arms around. That was my family because... You know, I met my wife on the first day of classes as we were college freshmen um, mm-hmm. at the University of Mississippi in 1984. And um, we start, we didn't start dating really for like two more years. But then we got married our senior year in college. And I remember the day we got married. I remember thinking, I will do this right. This is one I will not mess up. I'm going to be the best husband and the best father there ever was. and. Um, you know, there was a moment, as you just recited, because the one the one I will add into that list is my wife and I got divorced. And I also um, really saw my career fall apart. I lost everything. Uh, there was a moment 11 years ago where I had nothing left and I wasn't sure I could hang on to myself. Wow. And yet you did. And yet you did. Your you and your wife are back together. Yes. And your two children, Hudson and Mary, are doing well. They are. My son uh, Hudson, who was found nearly dead at a fraternity house on the University of Mississippi campus uh, the year before, we lost our son William um, to an accidental overdose. Hudson is now ten years sober. Got sober at the age of. Uh, 21, he lives uh, right behind me and is married and has a young child who's three year old, three years old. And we get to see him like five to seven days out of the week. And, um, you know, at times I pinch myself. Somebody told me just the other day, they said, man, you, you really live in it all. You, you've got it so good. And I think it, I, I made a joke and the one was nearby and I picked up a copy of my book, Dear William. I said, hey, you might want to read this. It, it's, not, it's not all it's, it looks like. But, you know, Elizabeth, the point of all of that is I think that um, in a lot of the work that I do, both 
professionally and as a volunteer is about uh, spreading that message of hope. My, my wife and I and my family and I, we suffered a great loss because of our family of five, we lost our William, our oldest son. We can never get him back. Now, he was a casualty in this great war we fought against addiction. And, and I'll be honest, I think we'll fight for the rest of our lives. Um, but what we found is real success, tools, support. And um, I think what our story is, and is which is why we share it so honestly, is um, yes, our situation seems a little, a bit unique and extreme. Though I must say, I had a friend of mine call me the other day, Elizabeth, to let me know, sadly, that they had now lost their second child oh. to an accidental overdose. So I, it, in ways, it's extreme, our story, but in ways, it's not. I think that, you know, in recovery, we talk about the phrase compare and despair, where you look at somebody's outsides and think, they have it so easy. They're so blessed. They're so lucky. Why aren't I? And mm -hmm. your story and this book is a real lesson in things aren't always as they seem. From the outside in, your family did look like the all-American family yes. and did look like the perfect family. And yet four of the members of that five-member family were struggling with the disease of addiction. And that mm -hmm. isn't that uncommon. You write in this book, Dear William, very honestly and openly in a way that is almost, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but I can feel like I'm over, I'm, I'm overhearing a conversation I'm not meant to hear. It's mm -hmm. that, it's that personal. You got the permission from all of your members yes. of your family to write like this, to rip the, the curtains back, the sheet back and yeah. reveal all the ugliness that had been hiding way down deep inside. Mm. Right. So my wife is not nearly as, um, I do a lot of public speaking, particularly about addiction and family uh, recovery. Um, she, is, she does sometimes as well, but she's not as public of a person as I am. She's more private. So it's interesting that she, more than anyone, is the one who pushed me to write with so much detail. Now, I mm -hmm. did not let her read the book until it was finished. I said, uh, you can't read it along the way. But each morning when we would have our coffee together while I was writing it, she would look across at me and go, David, and she would kind of point down to her heart and down to her stomach. You, you have to get down here to tell this story. My wife as a spouse was supporting me to get where she knew I wanted to go, which was I felt born to on this earth with a reason even as a young child, I thought, I will write a book that matters, that can improve lives. So I think she pushed me for that reason. And then I think she pushed me for the reason that so many families can relate to this pain, even if not in our extreme way. People have suffered loss. People, um, most families will at least have one member suffer some type of addiction, immediate family or extended family. So, you know, but also family loss, uh, searching for purpose. All of these themes are what we as humans and as families uh, are really fighting for to find our unity together and our joy as individuals and together. Well, you really did go there. Um, your book opens with you discovering your son's body. And um, I have to tell you, as the parent of two teenage boys, I almost couldn't bear to read it. Here's what you write about standing outside his door and the police officer telling you not to go in and look. William was hauled away on a gurney with a sheet covering his head. I stayed outside, watching with a hand over my mouth, muffling sobs. Two days later, we had him cremated, and I didn't ask to see his body before they reduced it to ashes. At the memorial service, I declined to speak, crippled by pain and a sense of responsibility. Besides, I did not understand what happened to William, what happened to me, what happened to our family. So how could I use words to put his life in perspective? But I was wrong about all of it. I shouldn't have listened to that police officer. I should have fought my way to William's side, wept beside his body. I should have stroked his wavy brown hair back from his forehead and kissed his cheeks. I should have found words to tell him the love in my heart. I should have held his hand and I should have closed his eyelids on the world. 
I'm, I get emotional just reading that. I mean, that's like. Yeah. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And I so desperately do not want any parent to have to find their child like that. And yet every day we're actually seeing that number go higher and higher. And I personally, I've just had enough, you know? I mean, I have had, I cannot get my son back. He is gone. But, you know, whatever breaths I got on this earth, I mean, I just remember that so vividly, Elizabeth, and no parent should ever have to go through that. It's our worst nightmare in every possible way, right? You had been newly sober when that happened. Yes. How did you stay sober through that? <laughs> I don't think a lot of people gave me high odds, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think I, I could feel the whispers behind my back. I had I was new in getting back up on my feet. And really the turning point for me was um, flushing the Adderall down the toilet. And mm -hmm. I really didn't understand what I was doing when I did that. Like, did I even need to detox? I mean, it was a doctor's prescription and I was taking it generally as prescribed. And I say generally, meaning I would have abused the heck out of it. It, but I was so addicted to it. I was afraid that if I used it all before the month ran out, I'd be a problem. You know, mm -hmm. uh, occasionally I would dip into my daughter's stash or something. But other than that, I didn't know what to get anymore. And so what I did was I talked the doctor into just taking me to the highest dose he could comfortably give me, you know. Um, so that that was my means of of getting it. And then once I realized oh my gosh, I'm addicted to this. And it has ruined that combined with, then it increased my alcohol consumption mm -hmm. because I would start drinking. I'd be like, oh, I can't even feel that five o'clock drink. So then I had more um, and it was a, just a lethal combination. Um, and when I quit it, I didn't really know what I was doing, except I knew that I felt like it was the devil. Mm -hmm. And I never had known what people talk about the devil. It just seemed to be this thing that I didn't understand. I thought like, I get it. This is the devil and I'm going to try to separate myself. And so I flushed it and I just didn't know, you know, how that would go uh, because I was ill prepared. Somehow I made it through. Um, but you could say certainly by the time I found William did. Well, well, first of all, I was really new when our son Hudson nearly died. Mm -hmm. And then it was a year later that we found William dead. And so it was like, I'm trying to get up on my own feet, but I'm this punching bag. Mm -hmm. But I felt a sense of responsibility for what my sons were going through, honestly. I really Stay did. Stay sober. You felt you had to. I felt like I had to because I felt like I helped drag them down their road to get there, to their addiction. You blame yourself? Uh, blame is a, I try to avoid, that's a great question. I'm going to give you uh, the best answer I can because the answer is yes, but I'm going to deflect from the word. Um, I really try to avoid blame in all levels of my life because I don't think humans are healthy and happy in blame. I think the, the culture of blame is very dangerous in everything we do in life. So I try not to blame myself. I try to own a level of responsibility. Does that make sense? You know, um, I, I try to own the responsibility rather than punch myself for blame. Right. But the point is, is that do you believe Hudson and William would have suffered with drug mm -hmm. addiction and Mary would, would have suffered from an mm -hmm. eating disorder if you hadn't been drinking and abusing Adderall? Well, and, and infidelity. The things that come along with addiction, we, 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 when we get stuck in addiction, I mean, we are, we are trouble. I mean, the, <laughs> I get to work with a lot of students and the, their parents sometimes will come to me and they go, I mean, I just don't understand my son, my daughter. I mean, they're just not truthful with me anymore. And I go like, welcome to the world of addiction. It's hard to be truthful with yourself. And so 
Do I think I have a level of responsibility? Absolutely. Do I think that my children, because of heredity or DNA factors that we still don't fully, fully understand, but we know are there, do I think that they might have suffered to the level they did if I wasn't also putting them in a toxic environment at home? I think possibly. But do I think that my suffering in addiction, which led to um, some depression, which led to marital infidelity, do I think that that environment was toxic enough to where it absolutely had to contribute to my children's suffering? Yes. Period. Yes. And, And I'll tell you a quick vignette why. My son Hudson, after he'd nearly died, Elizabeth, at the fraternity house, he goes to an intensive outpatient treatment center um, in the Chattanooga area. And it's family day. In mm-hmm. fact, those family days are so powerful. Mm-hmm. It's family day. He tells a story about each of us. But the story my son Hudson tells about me, his father who coached probably 20 of his youth sports teams, his father who tucked him in every night and said, I love you, who made him laugh, who tried, thought he was giving him everything. My son Hudson told at family day only one story about me, and it wasn't about coaching, and it wasn't about tucking him in. It was about how when he was young and we were on a beach family trip, he and his cousins had approached me for ice cream money. And we had been having an adult dinner, laughing at the beach with multiple bottles of wine. And Hudson came up and asked for the ice cream money. And he tells at family day how I pulled a $20 bill out of my wallet and handed it to him. And I smugly feel good about myself, the father doing the right thing. But he and his cousins watched me put my wallet back toward my back pocket. And after multiple glasses of wine at dinner that night, I missed my pocket with my wallet and I missed again and then put it in. And I actually remember that. But I, until I heard him say that, I remembered it not in the same light as he saw it. That is the one story that my son told about me at family day. So yes, I do feel a level of responsibility. You write that you started drinking when you were just 14 years old. Uh, You also write very honestly about the challenges of growing up in a family where you were adopted and you didn't have a lot of answers about who your real birth parents were, Mm -hmm. why um, you were put up for adoption. you started drinking quite, you know, at 14. I think 14 sure. is young. It seems um, young to me now. It's, exactly. <laughs> um, but then you go on to write that how this love affair with alcohol grew. And there was a part in chapter five that um, I really related to from my alcoholism. You write, I've developed a crush on red wine. Fermented grape is less filling than fermented hops, and its sugar hits my bloodstream like a Snickers. I stop by the liquor store daily after work for a bottle. Kent will drink one glass at dinner, and I'll drink the rest. If, on a rare occasion, she tops off her glass, I watch her pour, anxious there won't be enough for my third glass. Not that I'm addicted or anything. No way. I've seen the frail, toothless man begging for money outside the liquor store. I'm nothing like him. It's just that I have a stressful job, that's all. And when I come home, I take the edge off. (laughs) I felt I did the exact same thing, thing, you know? (laughs) Especially the watching, you know? Well, wait a minute, hold on, don't have too much because I I won't get enough. My, isn't that just, so so for for listeners, Kent is my wife and um, her... Isn't that so pathetic that I'm, I would stare at, if she would start coming back for a little refill and the bottle was getting low, I would get anxious. Mm -hmm. So that should have been my first sign of trouble, right? I mean. And we ignored those warning signs. I totally ignored it because I was seeing so much around me. I could tell about friends who drank more than me. And it was just so smug that it's embarrassing. Um, and, and, you know, on one of those nights, and you probably remember I wrote about this in Dear William, which was um, one of the hardest memories in, in talking about responsibility. Again, my, 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 my children may have all ended up there if I had never had a drop of alcohol. I, I, I mean, clearly there was some DNA factors. But I was so anxious, Elizabeth, that what you were just relating to and what I felt 
I was so anxious deep down that my children would end up there that I remember when William had drank too much at a party in high school and I was, or, or we caught him smoking marijuana and I was beside myself. And I guess I was really beside myself because of my fear that he would end up on my road. And, mm. you know, I go to that bottle of wine that you just read, you know, from the book about, and, and I had to sit down and talk to my son, William, about his substance use in high school. And to comfort myself for the conversation, I poured myself a big, tall glass of wine and sat there. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And he was sitting across from me on the chair and I was on the couch and I was waving this glass of red wine around that I was drinking. And I was like, William, I mean, don't you understand what you're doing to yourself? You were so smart. You have so much going for you. Why would you put it all at risk, you know, smoking marijuana or, or drinking alcohol? As I wave my glass of red wine around in my hand and he just glared back at me and I didn't understand that glare, mm -hmm. but he was smart and now I do. Yeah. You write about, you call, you know, your morning popping of Adderall pills. Uh, you say it's like communion with the devil. I love that phrase. Communion with the devil. It, I, it was so evil, but I needed it. I thought so badly because the first time I took one, the doctor gave me a prescription. I opened the bottle and I swallowed it. And I had always been afraid of illegal drugs. So I'd had no experience with cocaine or other stimulants like that. I opened the bottle, a middle age, I pop one in. And I mean, within 30 minutes, I'm incandescent. I, my, my brain is on fire. And for that moment, I just thought I can solve anything in the world. And I went home and I told my wife, this is the best drug ever. Hmm. And within 30 days, I had finished a book that I'd been behind deadline on. You know, for a moment, it probably, it gave me a boost, I guess. Then that moment wore off and I could never duplicate that feeling again. And I talked the doctor into upping the prescription. I then drank more alcohol. I then figured out if you, if you got nicotine in your brain, it would kind of give an illusion of trying to keep the, the Adderall from wearing off. So I remember William saying to me, Dad, who starts smoking in their mid-40s? But I did. And it's because, not because I like cigarettes, I actually loathed them. It's because... I needed it in my mind to keep the Adderall in place as long as I could. Um, it was communion with the devil. It burned a hole through me. It stole my soul and it took my family and stomped them out like a cigarette butt. Did anybody, while you were growing up, when you were an adolescent and high school and college, did Kent during your marriage, did anybody ever, your doctor, did anybody ever say to you, Oh, David, you're drinking too much. Or yeah. that Adderall, you're you're taking too yeah. much. Well, Did I no think, one say anything? Yeah. Well, so the drinking, you know, there were just I wasn't the heaviest drinker around. And so for a long time, nobody did. I, I remember my mother-in-law used to be trying to encourage me to drink more. <laughs> she culturally, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. She culturally just came up for an era in the 60s in college where if you were having fun, you were, you know, packing around a six pack of beer and, you know, that's what you did. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if it was the quantity always with me. It's that it, it at times could get me in trouble. But you describe in the book stories of having to be well, your sure. friend, like practically carrying you to your car right. and saying, you got to go home. You got to no more drinking. That's I mean, right. there are clearly people in your life who are seeing. Yes. You know, it's not normal for a grown man to get that drunk that he is no. stumbling around and, you know. Well, a lot in some of those stories, I think with once the Adderall was kicking in, my drinking really expanded. Right. Because and it's so, a stimulant. Oh, yeah. Because so then at first, I mean, you're drinking in the normal amount and you don't even feel it. 
So a few turned to six and six turned to eight drinks. And then the Adderall wore off and then I was falling down drunk, you know? Um, And at that point, I think that I was alienating myself from so many people. What happens is by that point, you surround yourself with people who are just giving you what you want to hear, you know, sadly. And so that's where I was. It's who I was hanging around probably. And so I was alienating myself from my wife. She couldn't get close enough to tell me that. Uh, Some of my, my closer friends I was no longer spending time with them. And I think that, you know, back earlier in my life where I write about, there would be these flashes of, oh my gosh, I just went to this thing and I didn't mean to get drunk. Well, at that time, you know, I was a young father. I was working, even writing about teaching a Sunday school class. And, you know, I had enough things that while alcohol would flash up and bite me and I would Mm kind of go, huh. Um, you know, I would still then back away from it at times and keep a lid on it. It wasn't until I really began to be self, uh, more introspective once it really became a full-fledged, obvious problem that, that I could reflect back and go, you know what? I always wanted to write a great book. And what I did was write a lot of very mediocre books at best because of alcohol. I wanted to be a better student, but I I was less so because of alcohol. I wanted to be a much better husband, but I was considerably less so because of alcohol, because I would put myself in situations. Or instead of looking at my wife and telling her how beautiful she was, I was ogling the last swig of the wine bottle. Yeah. You write in the book that you finally tossed all the pills down the toilet during a cross-country trip that you took with William. And there's a story on that, about that, that drive that is Mm. very striking, not just because it's what led you to finally throw those pills down the toilet, Mm. but also because of the fact that you didn't confront your son when you knew he was using. You, you Mm -hmm. describe a scene where the two of you stop at a gas station and William goes to the bathroom and you fill up the tank and, you know, wipe the windows and go into the store and pay for the gas. And 20 minutes goes by before your son emerges from the bathroom and you can Mm -hmm. tell that he's on something as you are driving away and you don't say anything to him. Mm -hmm. Why not? You know, we, we, we're in this intimate setting of a very small car and a big, big catastrophic winter storm was approaching. I'm his father. He's my son. And you're right. At that moment, I'm like, he's totally stoned. I mean, he's been in there snorting an upper cocaine, mm-hmm. perhaps, and he's just looped. Um, and I had still not become comfortable talking to him at that level. I had tried at times when he was a teen, I was better at arguing about it. I had not reached a point of really being able to have an empathetic conversation. And so I'm figuring if I really let it out, I will just erupt my fear because our fear as parents, um, parlays into anger sometimes as that emotion translates, you know? And I'm in this car and we're driving across the country. The snowflakes are starting to fall and there's ominous signs in the forecast. And in my mind, I'm just going to keep talking to him, not directly of you are high as a kite and you are an addict. Rather, I'm going to talk to him about virtues of good living about about treating people right, treating ourselves right. And so I kind of began that and I'm telling him less telling William lessons I had learned from writing business books uh, about rid all that adds no value. So it's an indirect lesson without calling him on the 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 proverbial carpet. Do you think though today's David McGee sober mm, yeah. David McGee in recovery David McGee would have sure. handled that differently? Sure. Before I even got in that car, long before we were on that road, I would have handled it so differently, which is had such an open and honest conversation with him like I get to do with teens 
and 20-year-old people today. I get to just begin having a conversation about them and who they are. And I get to relate about some of my failings and my shortcomings, you know? But the point is, the point is that a lot of parents, I think, mm-hmm. feel, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Yeah. I don't know how to handle this. Um, mm. And like you, they might have already had a blowout screaming argument right. and they don't want to have. I mean, I know as a parent, sometimes I'm like, I'm supposed to pick my battles. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know. Nobody gives you a script as a parent. Nobody yes. gives you an owner's manual and says, yes. this is what you're supposed to do in this instance. You know, break the glass and, you know, pull the alarm in that instance. We don't know. We're constantly guessing. We're constantly self-checking and constantly second-guessing our choices. I I'm sure many parents have mm. found themselves in that front seat. That's right. With their child, certain their child is stoned or hot, yep. certain their child is on the wrong path, and uncertain about mm-hmm. how to handle it. So, mm-hmm. as a parent yes. in recovery himself, looking back, mm-hmm. what do you wish you had said that night specifically? I wish I had said, William. I love you so much, and I know you. it appears you are high on a substance, so there's probably not too much conversation we can have about this at this moment. But when, when you come down and when you're ready, I think we need to talk about this. I'm concerned about you. I'm concerned about your well-being, and I want to talk if there's some solutions that we can do to help you refine your your footing in life, to help you refine your joy and get the William back that we know. That's the conversation that I advise parents today to have. And you know what, Elizabeth? We did learn from that. And that's that's a lot of the conversation we had in our daughter, Mary Hallie, when she was battling eating disorder. We were able to have those frank conversations. And she got to where she could trust us and speak back. And we could talk openly about, oh, I think there's some residue around that toilet. I'm, I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that... So we actually improved. We really learned the hard way. I don't advise to others to learn by burying a child, but we learn the hard way. You have that rare perspective as a person in recovery mm-hmm. and a person mm-hmm. with children who are yeah. now blessedly two of them in recovery. But having gone through the unimaginable tragedy, but all you have that perspective of seeing mm-hmm. it from both sides. That's I mean, right. You know, I I always I, I always love to tell people that the people who helped me most when I was struggling were the people who didn't, you know, point a finger and yell and oh. scream. That it was yes. the loving, but I don't know. I needed people to back off. But still firm, loving yes. but firm. Loving right. but but firm that I see I see you are hurting. Right. I feel you are hurting. Um you, you make such a great point, and this advice to parents and advice to spouses is so important. And, you know, um, one thing that I, this is just such a good time to drop this in. And you know, one of the most beautiful things in my life, and it's, you know, I mean, it, it makes me emotional even talking about it because it's so beautiful. And we lost a child, and I tell people, don't feel sorry for us. I mean, we're okay. We're, we are okay. We miss him every day and always will. But my son Hudson, um, who is now 10 years sober, and as I mentioned, it's kind of coincidence, but we actually live by each other now. Um, and so when you were an adult like me and you were sober, you you lose some friendship. Like you have valuable friendships and they're still your friends, but the party invitations start dwindling. And my, my son Hudson, we feed each other in that sobriety because we um, like a lot of the same things. We play golf together. We go duck hunting together. We um, talk a daily. And and so really it's interesting. My son Hudson, who I always felt some responsibility for helping take him down that road, you know, even more than I'm taking him on this new road, he's taken me. He is my role model and it has shifted to where he's probably the person I look up to the most. And that joy as a parent, I think is what's so important to share. 
And I'll end that long piece part by saying, we don't even realize it, but like when Hudson and I are together, his wife and my wife, and then my daughter, we actually talk about recovery so much at the dinner table that a lot of our old friends would probably leave. And it's just become our life. And uh, we find a lot of joy in doing that together, you know? There's something else in the story of William that I think is important for our listeners to know if they have somebody in their life who is in recovery and is in treatment. Because William overdosed and died shortly after getting out of rehab. Yes. And you write in the book, progress, however, can become the addict's worst enemy since renewed strength signals opportunity. Addicts go to rehab because substances knock them down. Yet once they're out of treatment and they're feeling more confident, they forget just how quickly they can be knocked down again. They're so vulnerable in their recovery. You and know? I think so many families are like, oh, you're cured, you know, and employers, you get out of rehab. Okay, you come right back. You're cured. You're fine. Boom, done, over. Yes. They want it to be like this TV image of a long time ago when somebody would go off for alcohol for 30 days and they just kind of disappeared and then they're back and everything's good again. Um, well, everything is actually not just good again when somebody is emerging from treatment. It's amazing again. But that doesn't mean that it is um, void of pitfalls because addiction and recovery is a journey. And um, people want so badly, particularly parents with their children, or you mentioned employers, um, they want so badly to see it as this black and white thing, as either or, when the truth of the matter is it's neither nor. What I tell people is when you can find somebody that you sense is doing well in recovery, go hire them. They will be the the best employee you will ever get. But look, as parents, as even an employer, anybody... You know, th- there's no such thing of a promise. It's like if you have cancer, which I've had cancer, I had it cut out, it's gone. You know, it it it's always kind of there. It it may show back up, and then I'll have to go right back in using all this medical and everything I have to do to fight it away again. And I I've heard my daughter talk about that in eating disorder a lot, um, in her, her own journey and. She says, you know, I'm, I'm doing this for a lifetime and I'm doing the same. I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll next week I'll travel and I'll go check into a hotel and I can travel by myself now and I do, but I'll walk by the bar and, and sometimes still my mouth might even water for like half a minute. Mm. And I just go like, yeah. And I usually will make myself go get something to eat pretty quickly. Um, you know, and so William... I understand what happened to him, to go back to the point you brought up, which is he was doing amazing in recovery. I remember it breaking my heart after he died when a friend of mine said, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought he was doing so well. And I was like, oh, my gosh, would you hear me? He was doing so well. He had just gotten a promotion at his job. He was planning to go to law school. They were bragging on him at work. I'd gotten a call from somebody going, your son, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. He was doing so well. And I I needed the my friend to hear it just like I need the world to hear it now, you know? That is something I think that people who haven't battled the disease of addiction and people who haven't been to rehab don't understand. And I think this Mm. is important for any of our listeners who have somebody like that in our life. Personally, I think, and I think others would agree with me, that the most dangerous time are those days, hours, minutes, right after you get out of rehab. When you're in rehab, there aren't wine stores and restaurants, you know, and liquor stores and drug dealers. You can't Mm -hmm get that whatever your substance of choice was. Right. You get released from rehab, sometimes with just 30 days, and all of a sudden, your temptation is right there at your fingertips. And you're new, you're you're a newborn in the world of recovery. 
And it's very often when people relapse. That's why statistics show that you know people yes. often relapse three, four, five times before they get sober. They often re. I, I I tell parents so many parents that I help a lot of students get to treatment, not just here at the University of Mississippi. I mean everywhere because they've seen some of the work we do, and you know even writing the book, I will have people reach out to me. A lot of parents they read the book sometimes two or three a day, and I will give them a referral you know, go check out this resource. Um, But I often tell them, you know, statistically, it's not 30 days. And sometimes it's not even four or five at a lot of the treatment centers, particularly if opioids are involved. I was fortunate, never encountered them. William, my son, however, did. And and let let's look at all the under uh, underprivileged and underserved, um, you know, constituencies across the country. They can't even get their first 30 days uh, if they don't have insurance. So they don't have, so, you know, for me, um, that's really why we told this story. And William, William was doing great, uh, but he was at risk. But, but I'll say this about recovery. Um, you, you make a great point about when you're in treatment, there aren't drug dealers and bars. Usually I think I've heard some tales, but usually they're not drug dealers um, there. But for me in recovery, Elizabeth, it's interesting. It is. I had some. I had a friend say to me once. It seems like it's pretty easy for you. And I said, "Well, it is and it isn't." You know, I just told about you know walking by the hotel bar and mm-hmm. my mouth might draw up or something, and that's not uncommon. Um, but but a lot of days it is easy. But I'll tell you one reason it's easy for me. It's because more than alcohol, even Adderall was my devil. And it came from a doctor and I never knew how to get it outside of a doctor. And there aren't Adderall bars all around me. If there were, you know, I would, it'd be a lot harder. It would be a lot harder. And William was in a situation where, you know, opiates had become his thing and it was in his fingertips at his phone. And my, my son Hudson, um, He was very bold. So where he had his accident in a fraternity house, obviously, was in a college town here in Oxford, Mississippi, at the University of Mississippi. And he he moved away, went back to Chattanooga, got up on his feet, and then he married and he moved to Bozeman, Montana. He had this amazing career as a software sales leader in his 20s. And he really just put his energy into the outdoors, rock climbing and fly fishing. Uh, but then then when they had a child, they thought, you know, we want to be close to grandparents. They they thought that was an important part of um, having a fam- raising a family. So they moved back here. I was with Hudson so maybe a year in the first year after he moved back, and we're at a evening music festival on the town square. And some gentleman I don't recognize walks by Hudson and kind of shouts at him and gives him a nod. And I could tell, and I was like, Hudson, who was that? And Hudson just kind of shook his head. He said, well, I've got to be honest. He was a drug dealer to me when Mm -hmm. I was here as a student. And I think about the courage that my son Hudson had to move back to this town where this accident had happened, where he had this behavior. But that's why I say he's my role model because he didn't just go back into the same haunts. He didn't go back to the same friends. He lives a different life. And that's, you know, I think what a lot of us on this journey try to do. You have set up at the university um, a center that you've named after your son, the William Mm. McGee Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. You say, quote, to help tomorrow's Williams. It must be Mm. incredible for you to take an unimaginable tragedy and turn it into an opportunity to save other people, other families from that same fate. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, it has been, first of all, it's a calling. More than doing it to honor our late son. I mean, William is dead. And I don't mean this cold, but dead is dead. I cannot bring him back. But I'm so also concerned, mostly concerned about the pain that's on this earth and the pain that individuals and families have for mental health and addiction. It is severe. 
It is an absolute epidemic in crisis. And I struggled so much of my life. I would have jobs because people would say, well, you have talent in that area. Or I thought I had talent in that area. And after a while, I would lose interest because I didn't have a purpose. And then I felt shame because I thought, well, yeah, I should just go do it. But I just didn't care about a job. I wanted a purpose. And what I learned from crawling across the floor was I learned what my purpose is. And my purpose is, you know, I have been given, I'm not a great storyteller, but I can tell stories. I'm not a great writer, but I can write. And I, what I learned is through adding um, some real grit and determination to those skills, I can maybe improve them a little bit more and put them to use to helping others. So my wife was a big part of this journey. We just said, yes, our family story of having that picturesque family, you know, the American dream, and it completely shattering. And us being so broken, but finding a way to fight out of it, not to boast on our own success, but to help other students and families, we decided that is our purpose. And so I had the opportunity to move back to my where I was adopted and where I grew up and where I went to college and met my wife and where my sons and daughter went, the University of Mississippi. And I, I said to my wife, I think this is where our work needs to be done. And she agreed. And so we found great grassroots support. Um, I wrote a viral column about William's um, death and as his struggles as a college student. And what we found is student groups, fraternities, sororities, faculty, staff, alumni, they spoke up and said, we share your pain and we have it too. Let's do something about it. And for years now, we've been working to find these solutions and provide this support, preventative, supportive, you know, um, uh, rehabilitative to, to students and also to families to help them not have to go down this road. In your author's note at the end of the book, you write, few American problems are more prominent than substance misuse, which touches every family and every demographic, inflicting emotional distress, education and job disruptions, and suffering, including economic hardship and legal problems. No place or segment owns this problem. Everyone does. And I thought about that as I recently watched many families from across the country testify on Zoom to the Sackler family, telling the Sacklers about their loved ones who had died of an opioid overdose. And they were everyone. One was a Marine. One was a doctor. One was a law student. Um, one was a man. One was a woman. One was a, a baby, a newborn, born addicted because the mother was addicted it really does touch everybody. And so many families suffer silently. I mean, it's starting to get better. People are starting to talk out, but there's such stigma still around the disease of addiction. This book that you've written, Dear William, first of all, you can write a fantastic book when you say oh. you're, you're not. Oh, it it is you. extraordinarily moving. There were times thank in you. this book when I had to put it down because it literally was too gut-wrenching. Hmm. But it's Thank powerful. You. It's powerful. And your work with the center is helping so many families. So, mm -hmm. David, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're right. This problem affects everybody across every demographic and every region in this country and across the world. Thank you so much. I, I think just all we can do to dig in and find solutions that, you know, let's throw down the gauntlet and keep doing the hard work. Thank you so much for being with us at Heart of the Matter. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Heart of the Matter. As a reminder, if you need help with a loved one struggling with substance use, you can text JOIN to 55753 or visit drugfree.org. You can find this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our website at drugfree.org slash podcast. And if you enjoy what you hear, please consider leaving us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. We'll talk to you soon.